conditions. And I included this, this was to remind me, this is a picture of an elephant shrew. And the reason it's in here is to, the importance of all this is because in, um, biologists like to talk about this fast, slow life history spectrum. So either something is really little, has lots of babies, lives fast, dies young, or it's something that's big and lives a long time and reproduces slowly, like an elephant. And bats are kind of weird because their life history is like an elephant. They reproduce very slowly, they live a long time, and so, as a result, they can't bounce back from a population crash the way that shrews might be able to. And so that's what has, that's part of the reason that biologists are a little bit, or not a little bit, are extremely concerned not only about white nose, but about the potential impacts of, of wind energy. And that's sort of the, the reason behind all of the work that we're doing on bats. And again, this is a picture of, you know, this is, this is what high risk conditions look like to a bat a warm night in September. And this turbine's actually off, you can tell by the way the blades are pitched. And that's really the only way to prevent bats from hitting a turbine, or the, the easiest way is to simply turn it off. Obviously it doesn't make energy then, but the work that we're doing is to try to figure out when you should do this to maximize the benefit, and how much time you need to do that to, to prevent too much mortality. I believe with that, this is another northern long-eared bat, but hopefully we have some time for some questions. And um, if you want to see this iPad bat detector in action, come on up. And otherwise, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming out. <laughs> Excellent. Some questions on pour some juice. We got cookies and all that stuff. Excellent. Yes, yeah, Steve. Okay, just I think you know. One of the things that kind of still needs to be hanging with John is um, the work that you've been doing is particularly, you're getting toward it at the very end. But there's been, you know, the mortality as you're seeing at wind farms and learned so much because of the studies that have been done there. But for, for a lot of the uh, uh, the promises that we have, they've tried to keep the, uh, they've tried to keep the deterrence and light deterrence. Right. And, and really, what you're doing now in terms of predicting um, when bats are present seasonally, at what time of the night, under what kind of wind speed, right. and, and temperatures, which I think we, you know. Right. Yeah, so, so the air, air is really a critical part of bat habitat. And warm, calm air will have a lot of insects flying around, and that's, that's good for a bat, because you know, they're, they're flying around only to eat. They're not just flying around to go from place to place. They, well, they're migrating, but they're also eating while they're migrating. So when it's cold and when it's windy, in particular, there's not a lot of insects up there. It's metabolically more difficult to fly. And so we really find that bats are actually flying around up high, you know, up, this is a couple hundred feet above the ground. They're really only up there when it's quite warm and quite calm. And actually I have a graph. This is a, this is a, like a contour map of when we heard bats. This is over six years in West Virginia. So there's something like 40,000 bat calls represented here. And almost all of them happened, you know, when it was 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, and this is wind speed in meters per second. Almost all exclusively less than four to five meters per second. But there's also a relationship where when it, when it gets warmer, bat activity does happen at slightly higher wind speeds. But when it's cold, they're really not doing anything above about four meters per second. And that's important because a wind turbine really doesn't start making power until it's about four meters per second. But a lot of these turbines, they weren't designed with bats in mind. They were designed with mechanically, you know, bearing life in mind and things like that. So a lot of them, so, so they freewheel. They, they just sit there and kind of run in neutral, not really generating power down here, two, three, four meters per second. So this is when bats are being killed. It's down here. It's really not up here. And of course, this is where you can actually make energy. So the, I, I, what I see is the, the solution for this issue is the fact that this, all of this activity is clustered when it's warm and calm. And we see this pattern almost everywhere we've done this. And so this, this really, with this type of information and a willing wind farm operator, you can turn them on and off automatically depending on the conditions and really focus that the cost of turning them off is really only justifiable when there's a lot of bad activity. And so you can actually, you know, you can, you can 
micro tweak them a little bit so that they're really not running when bats are active, or at least substantially reducing the, the exposure. Because again, the bats won't hit the turbine if, unless they're moving. That's the other critical part. Birds will run into buildings and wind turbines to some extent, but if, unless it's moving, a bat really isn't at risk at all. So it's, it's kind of a dynamic sort of risk. It, it's not always there. The bats are only there during certain times of year, certain times of night, and really a subset of weather conditions. Um, so this, uh, this type of information, which can be readily detected with bat detectors, I think kind of offers the solution or a solution for wind energy. It would be great if, if we could broadcast something that would, that would scare them all away from the wind farm, but that's proving to be you know, pretty technically difficult. And you know, when, where the wind industry doesn't want to turn the turbines off, but if it, if it proves to be the path of least resistance and if it proves to be of low enough cost, um, they will certainly, they, you know, they're doing a lot of work on this issue. And, and one other thing I think it's useful to mention with bat biology is there, there was a book published in 2003 that identified, it had a bullet list of you know, 10 or 15 goals. And these, were the, these would be the types of things that would be nice to do, kind of pie in the sky ideas for bat research. Like it would be nice to do some population genetics, to do migration studies, to do um, more behavioral studies. And oddly enough, almost all of them have happened now in the last five to 10 years but for reasons that the authors wouldn't have been excited about, really white nose and wind energy combined have driven a huge amount of research into bats. So we do know a lot more about them now, but the, the timing of white nose in particular has is, is got, <laughs> well, all we're able to do at this point is document very accurately how the populations have, have crashed, unfortunately. So it, it's, a, it's, a timely, it's timely that all these tools are available, but Unfortunately, there's not much that anybody has found out that can be done to, to solve the white nose issue. There's a lot of work being done. There's, there's a tremendous amount of research funding. Essentially, anybody who is studying bats prior to white nose, basically all they're doing now is white nose research. Um, so there's a phenomenal amount of work being done, but not too many, no, no easy solutions so far. Um, but it's not to say that there isn't one. But the, the light at the end of the tunnel, I guess, is that not all the bats are dying. And there are some bats that are surviving through the winter, and already they're seeing shifts in body size of bats. They're, the bats that are surviving are larger overall than the ones that, that aren't. So it's a tremendously interesting from an, ev from an evolutionary biologist perspective of the, the pressures that are going on for bats now because of this. So, yep. Uh, I have a question for this graph. Um, there's not much data below one and a half meters per second. Is that because the wind is never that calm? Oh, or, or I, I think this is because it's harder to measure down. It, it, these are measured by, by um, anemometers, like cup anemometers. I see. And at some point, they just don't, they, just stop, they, they stop turning. Okay. So I, I think yeah, okay. when I've done this analysis, I've, I've truncated it at two meters per second, just cut everything off, because I don't think the wind speeds are very accurate down here. But yeah, the, the I would expect a, a fair number of activity continuing. Right, right. Zero. But it's also, it's just not that common. It's not often completely yeah. calm. So this, this, is the, this is a factor of also the availability of these conditions. Right. So I don't have a slide of that, but basically there's a lot of time out here where there could have been bad activity, where we were monitoring, and there just simply wasn't. So th this is the interesting, the absence of activity right here is, is really the most interesting part of it. So there are bats. I mean, the, we, you do occasionally record bats at zero degrees when it's 12, 15 meters per second, but it's, it's a very small amount. So, yep. Yeah, so given how uh, agile they are in flight and how well their echolocation works, why do they have trouble with moving wind turbines? I think it's a question of scale. I think the, 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 the blades of these are 80 some, 80 meters long no, 40 meters long, about 80 or 90 meters across. And they're, they're rotating maybe 15 to 18 RPM. So the tips of the blades are moving several hundred miles an hour. And they can sense the turbine. They can actually, they think they're actually attracted to the turbines visually. It's an interesting thing on the landscape. A lot of these migratory bats roost around trees. They, they group around trees in the fall during their breeding season. So they, they do think that they're attracted from a larger area to the turbine themselves. and then. When the, they're not, they're looking, they're, the, they're used to being the things that are moving in the landscape, not 
something hitting them. So cars hit bats. Um, I think it's a question of, of something coming from an angle they're not looking for, basically. That's what's happening. So, yep. Um, from the data I've seen, I don't necessarily think so. The question is whether a couple turbines by themselves would be more or less impactful than a really large facility. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, you, per turbine, um, probably not. I mean, the, a larger facility would certainly kill more bats, but there's a tremendous regional variation in the number of bats that are killed in Maine. I think the, the aver they measure these things in, in fatalities per turbine per year. And it, the numbers range from, you know, they're in the low single digits. So two or three to five to 10 at the most. Um, a lot of projects, it's, 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 it's less than, you know, around five or, five or six bats per turbine per year. That's incidentally about the rate for birds. The, the problem is really down in the mid-Atlantic in West Virginia where the numbers are 20 to 30. Pennsylvania, the statewide average was, I think, 25 bats per turbine per year. That's pre, that's without doing the curtailment. The curtailment's what they call it when they shut the turbines down at low wind. But you can take a site that's killing 50 bats per turbine and you can get that down to two or three bats per turbine by implementing these, these curtailment measures. There's a lot of debate about how best to do that and whether you should do it whether everybody should do it only, or only certain projects. But there's certainly, there's a lot more regional variation than there is project size. And also turbine size, you know, little residential turbines that are 100 feet tall probably aren't killing any bats. It's the large, slow moving ones. Um, but really it's a, it's a problem mostly of the mid-Atlantic and to some extent the upper Midwest. Um, but the, the I don't think, there's not usually much data to get so individual turbines are a big problem compared to, like within a wind farm, it's not that you know, one or two turbines are calling all, causing all of the damage. It accumulates over time and over the whole area. So it, it really seems to be an issue with continental scale movements of bats. It seems to have almost nothing to do with the local bat population. It doesn't matter if you're near a roost tree or even near a cave perhaps, which is somewhat, un, un, uh, that's a bit of a surprise, I think. It's really just the interaction with these large scale migratory patterns of bats as they're going from you know, the Canada essentially down to the Southeast. So. Just to put things in context too, you know, we, we, um, we're, we're often looking underneath turbines. We'll take crews of people who their job is all summer long. All they do is they just walk Certain transects, they spend several hours under each turbine looking for any kind of uh, dead bird or, or bat. And, and, and frankly, bats are sometimes difficult because it could look like a little leaf or something like that. You really got to be careful. Uh, but these guys, they're, it, that's, that's their job. And, and um, it's a big deal to find something. It's, and um, enough that, that to test we have to go out and, and we'll do search for efficiency studies where we'll place things out there without them knowing to see if they pick those things up. We'll put things out there and leave them there to see if other animals like crows or right. fox or something will take them as a, a carcass removal study. So all of those, those interplay into trying to understand at the end of the day what's, what's our, what kind of mortality are you seeing out there. Right. So it's not like you're, you're stumbling over dead animals all over the place. Either. Right. Yeah. Yep. So I have two questions. Do they eat brown tail moths? And <laughs> second question is, um, we have bats in a bridge, or to wooden bridge. Mm -hmm. And from what you're showing here, my hunch is, as a complete non-expert, that they used to be little brown bats. Because I saw a dead one with the white nose. Mm. But now they are documented as big brown bats. So I think they're big brown bats now. Right. So. They find something good there. They want right. to live there. They're there. Would there be any way you could encourage more of them to come live, or would that be sort of a wasted effort because probably the environment itself is supporting as many bats as can reasonably be supported? Or? Yeah. Um, the first question: I have no idea if they eat brown-tailed moths. It would it would be convenient, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean. And, 
there's but, no reason why they wouldn't. There's no way. Of, yeah, I mean, they would eat the adult phase, the moth, rather than the larvae. And like, well, like budworms, the larvae is really what causes the problem. Mm -hmm. But eating the moths probably wouldn't hurt. That's good because but, then you can't you know, create cocoon. Right, and right. Shield. Yeah, no, that, that would be an interesting one to try. Yeah. But um, yeah, bats do eat a lot of moths. I mean, moth, they eat more moths than they eat mosquitoes. Um, but as far as the bridge goes, at, I'd say if they're using it, they've, they've found what they like. It's very difficult to create artificial roost habitat. They're like bat houses, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It's really hard to get it right because it, it's a lot of it's temperature. They're, they're, they're finding just the right temperature mix for them because that's, that's really what affects their metabolism, to get the right amount, the right degree of temperature. Um, it would be awfully hard to, we don't know what exactly they're looking for, I guess is the answer. So, if, if you could make more of the same thing, but um, there's no guarantee that they'll continue using it. But, you know, for example, the bridge in Austin, Texas, this famous bridge, they're in the expansion joints in the concrete. So these little cracks that are, you know, an inch or so wide, they're, they're full of them. And of, course, of course, now they actually have to maintain these things and they couldn't, so bridge design is actually kind of a major subject of research. And for, you know, industrial projects that are looking at mitigation, you know, creating bat-friendly bridges is, is a realistic option that, that might make a lot of difference. Um, but understanding what those factors are is difficult. And up in, in Maine, the thinking had been that bridges, they didn't get warm enough for a, for a bridge to be that very useful. But the more they're looking in Vermont, uh, the DOT is spending a lot of time looking for bats in their bridges, and they're finding them. So, you know, there are certain kinds of bridges that seem better than others, but I would say do as little as possible is probably the best answer. <laughs> so if you have to fix the bridge, that's where it gets a little bit complicated. But no, we've, as consultants, we've had exposure to projects where, you know, they've actually done work on a bridge with in, in a colony of Indiana bats. So here's a federally endangered bat living in a federally maintained bridge that they need to repair. They need to do whatever they need to do to it. And so they've actually figured out ways to, to put they've decided that you know the, the work had to happen in the summer for whatever reason and that's when the bats are using this bridge but they were able to do the work at night once the bats had left they put uh, sort of one-way bat exits each night the bats would leave they'd put up their do their work while the bats were out foraging take everything down the bats would go back in the in the morning spend the day there and they were successful in doing the project while keeping the bats out so it it's it's, there are some really interesting things that, that are required because of the regulatory structure surrounding these bats that you, know, you find yourself in some pretty interesting situations. And so there are solutions out there, but it takes creativity and it takes usually a, a regulatory structure to, to make it. Nobody's going to do this voluntarily unless it's sort of a small landowner's type of thing. But you know, there are ways of getting things done in a way that's minimally impactful. <laughs> Yep, Jane. Have there been any kind of experiments using lights embedded in the structure? Oh, in the wind turbines? Yeah. They, well, we did some work with ultraviolet lights shining on the turbines and actually away from the turbines to try to, as a deterrent, the ultraviolet, ultraviolet light has worked as a way of deterring birds. It's very hard to get, I mean, bats' eyes aren't very good. Mm -hmm. and. There's the trade-off between letting them know that the turbine is there and having them learn that's a bad thing. But the problem is they seem to be aware of the turbine. They want to they want to go see what it is, and that's when they get into trouble. So the, the idea is trying to just make it so unpleasant to be there that they'll leave, which is these acoustic like just blasting ultrasound from the turbines is one technique. There's actually some work on lighting the turbines with with LED lighting, I believe. Um, infrared lighting so that it would make it more visible to the bats just as a way of you know saying here I am avoid me lighting is tricky because birds are really attracted to light and so so the biggest problems to birds happen when there's a light on at a at a tall building or a lighthouse or a you know a beacon of light will cause major problems for migrating birds so there's kind of the trade off of, of it's a dangerous thing to mess with light but um you know, the most promising research seems to be the, the texture things on the blades and also the acoustic deterrence. So, yeah, it, it's, they're trying almost everything, though. There's a lot of federal funding right now going into this very question. So, 
there, there's, uh, the industry would love to find a gizmo that you can put on the turbines. That's way more exciting to them than turning the turbines off. You, nobody wants to build a wind farm to then turn them off. But if you can turn them off for such a brief amount of time that it, I mean, they're off a lot of the times anyway when it's calm. So it's really not, you can do it in such a way that it's minimally costly, but you know, it, it's harder to plan ahead for that sort of thing. So uh, engineers are definitely scratching their heads and thinking about it, but it's not as easy as you might think. <laughs> have we, we've done some, some of the UV LED lights. Like the LEDs have just really, over the last five to 10 years, have really kind of advanced quite a bit. And so we've gotten there now, they're able to very bright lights, and we've played with this UV a spectrum that would, could be mounted on a, on a nacelle and pointed out to scare bats away. It, and because it flashes, it's not going to attract birds. But but there's this the visible spectrum for bats is just the, the tails of those visible spectrums where people go like this and this is where we can see. Bats are like this. And if they overlap just a little bit, but that little overlap on a night, up on a turbine will make all the neighbors crazy. So right. <laughs> it's not right. something that, that any developer is interested in putting a light on there just to, you know, uh, to, to get everybody excited about it. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a conundrum. Yeah. Sure. Just back on the, on the fungus, uh, when it first was being talked about, they were asking people to have, if you had bats in your house, they were going to count or see if they had the fungus or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're still designing the information. Um, if there are bats in your house in the summertime, chances, the, the fungus really isn't a factor in the summer. Like it wouldn't be something that would get in your house. It's really a winter problem where the bats are, it irritates them and it makes them, they, they, have about, they have about an energy budget that's so narrow that they can afford to wake up a couple times a winter. And when they're waking up a couple times a month or even every week, they just run out of, of steam. And that's why they have to fly out to try to forage and it's January and so forth. So in the summer, you probably it would be unusual to see evidence of it. You might find a bat that has scarring, and certainly there's it's worth reporting it. Um, at this point, I mean, if you do have a colony of bats, I mean, Audubon was doing a, a colony count. There's definitely researchers at UNH that are doing genetic work on you can you can figure out what pests are in an area, what insect pests are in an area, by looking at the the DNA in bat guano because the bats are out there e eating insects and they can actually identify the insect species using the DNA in the bat guano. So there's a really, there's a, okay, well then, no, you should, <laughs> I, can, I can track, I can put you in contact with people at UNH and or Audubon, because, but, but yeah, there are definitely ways, they're interested in colony counts, certainly they're interested in figuring out what they are. If they turn out to be little brown bats, they would be very interested. <laughs> if they're big browns, it's probably not as exciting, but, but a lot of bat researchers are realizing that, okay, the bats that are here are the ones we should be studying. And so they're, they're, there is a lot more work being done on big brown bats than, than there had been. So we probably have, yeah. I'm just going to let oh. you do the raffle now. Oh, good. If people, okay. people want to leave, they can leave. If they want to okay. stay, they can stay. You know? <laughs> All right. Let's see, Jeanette McNeil. <laughs> they were the lucky winner. So pick, pick one of those, nope. whichever one you want, pick another one. Okay. Yeah. You know, the last time I came to one of your lectures, I won a beautiful Patagonia oh. jacket. So I would like you to take my name out of Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Patricia Duffett. Patricia? Patricia? Mm. Do, you have, do you have to be here? Is that the rule? <laughs> Oh, Jane Donnellan. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, you can her, How many of these do we want to pick? So we have two things there. Okay. Whoop. And James Turner. <laughs> James Turner. Excellent. All right. You can keep going. And All right. We have. I can. I'm. I'm happy to answer a couple more questions in the meantime. But yep. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, the question was what the status, what, what's going on in White Nose Research. Um, it's kind of everything you can think of related to White Nose. It, it's trying to understand what the disease is, what the pathology of the disease is. They've, they've kind of got that figured out. I think they know 
They know what it's doing to the bats. They know how it's spreading. They know that you know that they've sequenced it to know what the genetic, what it is genetically. And, and now I, guess, I think the research is really on control and trying to do something. Um, so I just read there's something like UV light they've found weakens the fungus or can even break it down. Um, they, they're doing all. They were originally doing all kinds of experiments on how whether you could decontaminate. A cave, and they actually did this up at, at the former Loring Air Force Base in Maine, where they there were these concrete bunkers that they they tried bleaching, they tried pressure washing, steam cleaning, and they they couldn't really get it out if from a concrete bunker, let alone a natural cave. So they're just trying to document where it is. But there are other interesting things. For example, Virginia big-eared bats um, don't live in Maine. They have even bigger ears than the northern long-eared bats. They're unaffected by white nose. They're also federally endangered, There's, but they're obligate cave bats, so they don't roost in trees all summer the way that most Maine bats do. Every night they go back to their cave, and, and it doesn't bother them. And so I think the assumption is that over evolutionary time, certain bat species have been exposed to this and survived it. For the same reason, European bats are unaffected, but this fungus has been in Europe for a long time. So over tens of thousands of years, you know, bats appear to be able to develop immunity to this sort of thing, but whether or not North American bats can, is there anything we can do to help them catch up kind of a thing? Because we, whether they will be able to wait 10,000 years is the debate. And, and again, you know, the, there's enough other stressors on bats before white nose that the habitat loss in terms of, if you look at the agricultural Midwest, there's not a lot of trees there. And that's, you know, that's where these bats roost all summer. So in New England, we're doing pretty well in the tree department. Um, so habitat really isn't a factor here, but I mean, until as late as the 90s, New York State was spending millions of year, dollars to kill bats because of rabies concerns. So, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of there were a lot of pressures prior to white nose, and so this is kind of one one more thing on their on their shoulders. So, um, I wish I had more encouraging news from from white nose research, but they're they're really trying to do a little bit of, of everything at this point and. You know, why are some species affected? Why are some not? But really, it's focusing on control. Can we, can we do anything about preventing the spread? Um, so, yeah. Ed? With, with the growth of, <coughs> growth of wireless proliferation and these guys <laughs> echolocating, is anyone that you know doing research on the effects of electrosmog on bats' ability to navigate? And I, don't know how not, they, I don't know how they migrate. Are they using Yeah, the radar not that I've heard. Um, I mean, ultrasonic... Ultrasonic echolocation is really good for really short range stuff, but ultrasound doesn't go very far. It gets attenuated in the atmosphere. The, the, the fact that it echoes means that it bounces off of things. So any particles in the air, including water vapor, will absorb the energy. So you can only, I think the furthest away you can detect a bat with an, with an ultrasonic detector is 80 or 90 meters. I mean, the bats, of course, might be able to hear each other much, much, much further than that. But I think the, I mean, near field of electronic stuff is in the gigahertz range, not the kilohertz. So I, th I think it's such a different, I mean, who knows what it's doing to them in other ways, but I, it doesn't seem to affect their... It's their, far enough away from their communi normal communication frequency. Right, right. It doesn't seem, you don't seem to be able to sort of jam their, mm -hmm. their uh, echolocation. If you play loud enough ultrasound, they just can't hear anything, but they'll just leave. So, but there do, I, I'm not aware of anybody that's been able to you know, induce them to <laughs> go to a place or not go to a place. But they're probably looking at it in terms of a deterrent potential. But um, to my knowledge, it doesn't. There's a lot of mismanagement done in power lines. You've got to be careful with that. But there's, you know, nice quarries like that. There's a lot of mismanagement done in some of those areas. Right. Yeah, I mean, places that are loaded with electronic, yeah, like like high high tension power lines. There's bats all over the place. So. I mean, the, the birds that have magnetized their brains that use to migrate and Right. Expose them to heavy magnetic fields, and they lose their orientation. Right. No, I mean bats do. They do orient themselves magnetically. They have, I think they have the the same. They're able to orient magnetically, and they think they can orient based on, on the angle of the light, sim similar to birds. They probably are using stars. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're probably not using echolocation when they migrate, and that's actually an interesting. That's another potential explanation for them hitting turbines is that they've. They've now done some work with thermal imaging cameras where they see bats flying along 
and they can tell that they're there, they can watch them flying past the detectors and they're not recording them. So for at least some of the time, bats can, they can turn off their echolocation. For a while they thought that it was linked to their flight muscles, so they, um, but the, it's, a, it's a sound that they create with their throat, just like a, you know, a bird, any other vocalization. So it's not a mechanical noise that they're making, so they can, they can turn it on and off. Correct. So, yeah. Sure, yeah. I feel guilty as how bringing up such a pragmatic question <laughs> in an esoteric question. <laughs> bats are actually a problem in my house. Mm -hmm. We're considering putting up some bat houses to attract them. I'm afraid that's going to attract even more. <laughs> yeah. Um, Am I right? Or right? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay to have bats along, around as long as they're not in your house. And so, the, um, now we've done some work, we did some work at an interesting house in Gardner that was a very big family house and there was a lot of room in between the walls and huge colonies of bats. And I mean, it's, the goal is to kind of keep them out of your living space and then gradually work your way out. And so it's, uh, I don't think that bat houses would make your problem worse, but the problem is they probably think your house is nicer than the bat house. So, <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I think, I, I don't have much practical advice. I, I'm good at telling you if there are bats there, but if you already know that there are bats there, <laughs> it's tough. I mean, there are, there are definitely ways to make little one-way gates for them to leave. I mean, there are ways to, to exclude them that are easier on the bats that really is, has to do with the timing of when you do it. So they, they, they're probably not there in the winter unless you also, it's, it's possible that you have a summer colony or it's possible you have a winter colony or both. And so, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, if you only see them in summertime, if you think they're gone in the winter, you can try all the exclusion during the winter to, so that they couldn't get back in. But they're going to be pretty determined to get back in there one way or the other. Um, I mean, it is possible to exclude them, but it, you know, it's, it's every little finger-sized hole that you could possibly find, which in, in, in a lot of houses, that's nearly impossible to find. And so, yeah, I wish I had more practical knowledge. Well, <laughs> but, you can actually locate where they're coming, and sometimes you can see, see the poop on the house. Right. Poop on where, right. if you watch, um, and to make those exclusions, it's not not that difficult. Right. Sometimes you got to get up high to go through it. Right. But it, is that a nice way of saying kill the bat? Well, no, it's like a one way door for them to leave that they can't get back in. And it's basically like a screen tunnel. Because I think they're using, they're using a combination of sight and smell to actually find their way in. And so if you isolate those, if you, if you make a tunnel that goes for their usual place and then takes them along the wall for a few feet, they can get out. But then when they try to get back in, they're going to fly right to the, their exit point. And if it's covered in screen, they're, they're not necessarily going to know that the entrance was a few feet away. So that's, that's the theory behind them. Um, there, but, are, there are companies that do bat control that will you know, get the bats out of there and bat proof your house. And, and you, you want to do it kind of t later, later in the summer after the pups have left. Right. You know, you be kind to the pups. Right. But I mean, there's definitely people that have, you know, even the hired the exterminator folks and, and there's mixed results. I mean, it, the best way is physical exclusion. I mean, if you went the old school way of, you know, poisoning them, the people do, it doesn't actually prevent, you know, it doesn't prevent new bats from coming in. It's really the physical exclusion. But bats are very loyal to their roost, some species. So you, you probably have a, a, you know, it might be some of the same individual bats that come back year after year. There's actually just a thing I saw in Pennsylvania, this couple that had one bat. So it was more of a cute thing than a whole colony in your house. But the same bat, probably the same individual, was coming back for 13, 14 years. And they're actually not moving until they want to stay there longer than the bat. So they're, you know, they're thinking of retire or moving to sort of another place. And, and they're like, no, we're going to wait until. <laughs> so, but no, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, you don't want a colony of bats in your house, generally speaking, because you know, they carry diseases and various things. So. Um, it's, but you know, it, the best way to do it for the bat's sake is to try to exclude them in the times of year other than you know May, June, July when they're rearing pups, and there'll be fewer of them then, so it should be easier. But you know, it's, it's, it can be a tough question. So.
If you get a chance to look at, there's a recent NOVA that just came out. Um, this phenomenal footage of uh, National Geographic. We had a special camera they set up in Bracken Cave down in Texas, where they got these three-tailed um, There's six, seven million bats in this cave. And when they come out, and we've we've seen them coming out of these types of caves, where in the in the in the it's, you know in the evening they start coming out in this river of bats that just comes out for and you know for an hour hour plus just and enough that you can actually follow them on weather radar. You can see mm -hmm. these clouds. But they, what this with this phenomenal photography, these guys set up and they put these cameras down with, with these bats coming back in and there's. It's just this flood of bats coming in, and yet they can go deep into these caves and miss each other and go right back to their their pup on this wall carpeted with little pups. And right. it, you know these, it's, you know, we just watch them flutter around our yards and get amazed. But to watch right. some footage like that and see what they're really capable of doing and how they fly, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, just phenomenal. Excellent. Cool. Well, I'll stick around. Um, I'll fire this thing up. But yeah, if you have questions, feel free to come by. But thanks so much for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of the night. <laughs>